Understanding your needs and challenges, what makes your future safer and more successful, that is what engages us. That's what we are best at. To be able to foresee or prevent what may happen, the complexity and relationship between various factors in the event of an incident must be understood. At Alandia Loss Prevention, we consider every eventuality with a human perspective. We are a well-groomed team with knowledge in human factors, global shipping, ship management and marine insurance. Alandia is a marine insurance entrepreneur with large resources and extensive expertise. We provide you with precise and accurate analyses. On a solid foundation, with more than 80 years of experience in marine insurance, our client promise is to meet the highest level of risk management needs. Welcome to today's webinar of Lessons Learned. This month's theme is occupational safety and in this webinar we will discuss the topic of cargo operations on row row vessels. We have an expert panel with us today and an excellent moderator, Alandia's loss prevention manager, Marty Simojoki. Uh, good morning, uh, good day, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending where you are. Uh, you're most welcome to our webinar. And I'm really happy to and actually proud to, to present our expert panel today. We are discussing uh, the row row and ropex uh, safety on, on, on during the cargo operations. And uh, I have the best experts in the field. And uh, on that note, uh, I would ask, in, in, in my view, uh, Mikael uh, from Stena, uh, you're the first one and you have about two minutes to tell who you are, where you come from and what what you look forward to contribute in, in this webinar today. Go ahead. Thank you, Marty. Uh, hi all, Mikael Lindgren from Stena Line Scandinavia AB, one of the companies within Stena Line group of companies managing about 35 vessels today. They do come and go, unfortunately, now in times of COVID. Uh, nevertheless, 35 about. Row paxes mainly, also some pure row rows. And of course, this topic that we will touch upon and discuss today is, is the core essence of our safety questions in Stena Line. We do have fast turnarounds. We want to head, at sea, head out at sea as uh, quickly as possible again to, to trade the vessels with cargo, both uh, travel and freight, which has become more crucial now during the COVID situation. And this is really one of the questions, the questions that is warmest at heart, how we do our utmost to protect the guys and girls on the vehicle decks from the immediate dangers that they are exposed to when it comes to well, the fast turnarounds that that uh, are nowadays uh, the day-to-day -day reality when it comes to our business, Roro and Ropax trading. So I'm really looking forward to this uh, seminar today hosted by Alandia. I have been 10 years with Stena Line this year, first four years at sea as nautical officers. And then I went ashore as marine superintendent, now with the ship management fleet operations organization in Gothenburg, which is considered the head office of Stena Line. We are trading Northern Europe from Ireland, uh, France in the West, all the way to Estonia or, or Latvia in the East. And uh, that says about all about me and uh, Stena Line and who I represent. Thanks, Martin. Thank you, Michael. And uh, next on my view on, on the starboard side, that's uh, Sten. Go ahead. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Sten Rosen Rosenqvist, and uh, I am a safety manager and DPA, CSO at Frederi Obe Eckere in Marihamn. And uh, my background is also nautical. I'm a master mariner and I have some seagoing experience as officers and master in uh, some different companies, Valenis Willems and Atlantic Container Line and so on. And I have been with the uh, Rederi Abe Eckere since 2012. And uh, Rederi Abe Eckere, we are operating three Ropax vessels in the Baltic Sea here, and we have one pure cruise 
vessel and three Roro cargo vessels. And we, we handle a lot of Roro cargo and uh, especially uh, the last few years we have seen that cargo and freight has increased quite a lot. So this is indeed a topic which is really, really, uh, re really important in this, in this time. So uh, my role here um, in Rederia Becker is to, my responsibilities are ISM, ISPS, and I handle some stability issues and cargo handling and quality issues in, in general. So yes, that's about everything from here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sten, and, and welcome again. And on my uh, port quarter, I have a Philip Svensson. Welcome. Thank you very much, Marty, and thank you, Lolandia, for uh, giving me this opportunity to be a part of the expert panel. It's always nice to be called an expert, not so often you get that title. Uh, I have a master mariner background, uh, approximately 18 uh, years at sea. Never worked on a Roro or Ropax vessel in my life, and I think that's why I was hired in the beginning in 2005, because I had a little bit different view on safety from other parts of the maritime industry. We uh, have a pool of approximately 132 uh, Roro and car carriers, which are traveling globally, uh, of which 88 are owned by ourselves and the rest are charter vessels. And of course, charter vessels always pose a difficulty because we are not in control over the ship managers, the ISM system, etc. So my role is to oversee and make strategic uh, uh, projects for enhancing both safety, quality and security uh, across the fleet, as well as cooperating with our land-based organizations. Uh, in a year, we transport around uh, four and a half million vehicles of different sizes uh, around the world. And we also handle about eight million vehicles on the land-based side for other carriers and for uh, a lot of the OEMs. And uh, I'm looking forward to this um, seminar and hope that I can contribute with some of the knowledge we have from such a large amount of vehicles moving back and forth our ships and our terminals. Thank you, Arne. Thank you, Philip, and, and, and welcome again. And, uh, and on the midships, I have Einar. Go ahead. Yes, hello everybody. My name is Einar Basse. I am the head of uh, cargo planning operations in Hög Autoliners. As many of you, uh, I also uh, I, uh, I enjoy being called an expert from time to time and I'm pleased to be announced as such one. Um, I gained my experience uh, at sea in uh, actually in your company, Philip, uh, in Valenius Williamson. And, uh, but that uh, is now close to 20 years ago and have been on uh, shore-based uh, staff ever, ever since. So I joined Hög Auto Runners in 2007 and after a short break to Short Sea, I rejoined again in 2015. And we are, we have been um having a focus for for uh, quite some time on uh, static pieces r carried on roll trailers which is we see that that is the our major challenge um for uh, for carrying safely on board the roro vessels so we we operate about 40 vessels uh around the world uh, carrying uh, the same uh, commodity and cargo as uh, Valens Williamson, but uh, I have to admit, not in the same total volumes though. But uh, again, uh, we we have a dedicated focus on uh, having a clear uh, cargo acceptance criteria when it comes to static and breakable cargo. So so that is also what uh, we would like to uh, to distribute uh, again also to the our charter vessels which don't have the same access to our internal systems so but uh, yeah thank you that's uh, that's all for me thank you Einar, and welcome again and uh, last but certainly not least uh, anders go ahead yeah hello everyone 
I am a marine superintendent on uh, Valdins Marine. And my background is uh, also nautical. I've been a uh, master on Valdins, Valdins vessel for uh, 20 years or something. And uh, we are today a management company. So we uh, have, uh, for example, Philip Svensson's uh, vessels, <laughs> some of the vessels. And uh, we also, at the moment, we, we just uh, uh, take over management on uh, destination Gotlands, one, one of theirs ferries called Visby. And we have some uh, new buildings for Valin Sol on the way. So we will have a uh, different type from car carriers to, to uh, uh, all kind of rural uh, vessels at the moment. Thanks. Hey, thank you, Anders, and, and welcome. Uh, uh, I would like to, I'm, I'm very curious to hear uh, the, the different perspectives and, and if, if we go a little bit back you know, we we heard all, all these uh, impressive years at sea and, and the experience and and uh, if we start a little bit back in time uh, how has the uh, the safety on row row decks or row backs decks uh, how has that been and 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 what what development have you seen and and if, even better if you can uh, name a concrete contribution what what you have made or your organization has made that has made a difference and whoever wants to go first yep since it was a queue i can i am happy to start uh, i think that the the first of all the the type of cargo commodity and the very uh, the various commodities that have been uh, that are being carried uh, now and in the past on Roro carriers, they are, um, it has, Roro vessels have attracted m more uh, breakable cargo and we still more complex cargo being carried on board the Roro vessels. It used to be quite, I mean, you can call it quite simple, everything rolled on board and lashings fore and aft and that's about it. But uh, it's getting more and more complex, uh, heavier and heavier. And um, it's also uh, uh, new different kind of uh, clients uh, are, are now setting up factories in different parts of the world that, uh, that triggers the need for transportation of items that have not been uh, carried to such an extent before. So, and, and now especially we see that with the current uh, container uh, rates are going sky high, uh, we get a lot of more questions from, you could say, uh, clients that is not used to how the cargo should be uh, prepared in order to safely carry it on board uh, roller vessels. We, of concrete or, yeah, Pure examples we had back in 2019. We um, we had uh, a nasty incident on board our vessels, and the root cause was uh, cable reels, cable drums. Uh, the weight of these reels are about uh, plus for plus minus 40 tons, and of course having a, a full full rigged cable reel roaming around in the cargo decks is not an ideal situation. And um, when digging into this kind of problem, there were two things that we have uh, rectified and that, the, and that is the requirement for a sturdy cradle. And we have set some parameters that uh, the cradle needs to fulfill and also how uh, this unit is stowed on the roll trailer and that have also made it much easier for the clients to know what we are uh, what do we require and also easier for the crew on board to um, to ensure themselves that this is uh, within their criteria and this is well secured so we have tried to um, move 
the cargo acceptance decisions further away from the stern ramp. Uh, if ev every cargo is to be vetted or, or and rejected or accepted at the stern ramp, that is uh, that is a last line of defense, which is uh, in many cases is too late. Uh, and if you reject it, with all good reasons, it will result in uh, disappointment from uh, commercially and also. Um, it, it puts a lot of uh, pressure and lots of decision onto one pair of shoulders instead of uh, several people involved in the process. Okay, thank you, Einar. I see Philip has to hand up. Thank you. <clears throat> I think that the biggest difference we have seen over the last 10 to 15 years is that uh, Similar as Aina said, that production is uh, not in the same traditional places as before, and which then leads to that you have much less skilled stevedoring uh, personnel, which is posing a much higher risk to uh, the crew and to themselves. And also the fact that uh, time in port has been shortened uh, dramatically, especially since the vessels have become larger, then you can actually load and unload simultaneously. So that's a much more traffic going over the ramp and in internal ramps than before. So the risk of something happening has actually increased. So what we have focused a lot on in the last years is the uh, vetting of uh, the stevedoring companies, training the stevedores ourselves. Uh, could some ports play complicated due to union restrictions, etc that we can't really choose uh, the best guys. And we have also had a very lot of focus on signaling men blind spots. And it's for sure that even uh, depending on I mean, cargo, a large and small may have blind spots, make it difficult for drivers and signal men to see the personnel as well. So we have put a lot of efforts in uh, in. Uh, focusing on, especially in single young men, especially when operating large vehicles, but also small vehicles could have the same problem. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. And I see Stan, Stan has a hand up. Uh, yes, I, uh, from, from my side or from our side, uh, we are operating uh, our ships more more or less on regular lines and according to, to very tight schedules and timetables. So I definitely agree very much with Philip's uh, comment here about the time in port. And uh, the, the turnaround time has has been shortened quite a lot the last few years. And this, this seems to be a trend that is going on. And from our point of view also, one one observation that, that we have done since, uh, especially the last year and a half since we had this COVID situation is that our cargo volumes has gone up very much on our uh, regular ROPAX lines. And this gives uh, tremendous uh, challenges uh, for the, from a safety point of view for the crew on board during uh, loading and discharging in port it is really really hectic so so safety is a big big concern in our operations on our regular lines so uh, that is that is our let's say our challenges the last the last uh, few years here and uh, but on on the good side i would also point out that a trend which is going on um, from a regulator, regulatory point of view, is also that training has uh, uh, training uh, has become more important and is also more more uh, regulated. And uh, this gives uh, us and uh, I think all all our colleagues also a good chance to to educate our crew in in safe procedures and uh, routines on board and how to, how to act and how to have safe, safe procedures on board the car deck during loading and discharging. 
Okay, thank you, Stan. Uh, Mikael or Anders, do you have anything uh, you would like to add? Uh, yeah, it's been talked a bit about uh, pressure, uh, as in commercial pressure. And I think that's that's one of the things that has really changed later years uh, from the beginning of the introduction of ISM and also when speaking about good and genuine safety cultures uh, and not necessarily a genuine commercial pressure, but most often a perceived commercial pressures. The people on the vehicle decks, they do their utmost trying to get the vessel prepared, uh, fully loaded so they can set to sea. And that's, that's, I think, really important to fight against that, to have the constant balance that, of course, you're supposed to do your very best, but to take away that perceived commercial pressure that we take it it, we allow the operations to take the time so we can do it safely. And that I think has become better and better throughout the most recent years, at least when it comes to row packs operations, where we depart on a time schedule uh, with hours and, and minutes pinpointed. And that is, that, that is a dangerous thing that we really constantly need to address the perceived commercial pressure. Thank you. Uh, under something you would like to add? Uh, yeah, I can I can fully agree with the, with the, all of you, but uh, in our case we have seen that uh, the schedule is changing a lot uh, during last years, and and uh, that's a problem when we when we come to 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 our uh, for our crew uh, when when they are changing the the. Uh, you know, the departure time and arrival time uh, to have to have this planning to have a safe uh, uh, safe operation on, on the deck to have all, all the people that is needed and, and things like that so so we can see that we are uh, we have problem to follow the the rest hours and therefore we are less and less people on the deck. Okay, thank you, thank you, Anders. And uh, moving from yesterday to today, uh, uh, I suppose uh, Mikael and Einar uh, mentioned the, the commercial pressure, and 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 since it's been been an expert panel, I'll I'll, I'll shoot another uh, double question to the panel. Uh, could you elaborate a bit more? How do you address uh, the perceived commercial pressure? Who where, where does it go? Who has the ultimate say? And, and how do you... Uh, I mean, it, it, it's a big decision that, okay, we, we need a half an hour more, uh, especially if you're uh, talking about Stena and Ekere and, 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 and you others, maybe you have half an hour, it's not that crucial, but but for you too, I, I, I can understand it, it, it's, it's a big decision. That how, how do you address that? And, and the second part of the question, uh, very hands-on, uh, what are your instructions? How, how are you safe? Uh, you have a short turnaround times, there's more traffic, it's uh, more dangerous, more cumbersome cargo, uh, more weights, uh, less people on the deck. How, how, what, what do you concrete instruct you, especially the new people, newcomers into industry? How, how do they keep themselves safe and, and survive? Uh, the, who, uh, I see Philip, Philip's already hands up, so, so go ahead. No, I, I can fully understand uh, that uh, a lot of the guys out there, uh, they have a perceived commercial pressure. And uh, historically, we have patted everyone on the back that left one hour earlier than scheduled. But now we instead, we, we pat them on the back for stopping. So they, they get actually a star in the book if they stop the uh, operations or say that now we can't go out, now we need to take rest, etc. So then we actually give them a star in the book instead of previously giving them a star in the book if they were quicker than they were supposed to be. So they have us as owners fully support that if they want to stop the vessel for any reason or stop the cargo uh, handling, they will have our blessing for that, definitely. This is really an importance of, of leadership on board the vessel. Uh, to feel that full support from the company as, as such, as a whole, and to continue, continuously have that 
dialogue on board the vessel and really stress the importance of that leadership and to continuously talk about the subject of vehicle deck safety to continuously during during weekly department meetings etc talk about this and really keep it a vivid and and living subject so that the people who are really down on the vehicles decks feel that you have that support from the loading officer, the chief officer, the master on board, all the way from the company to continuously discuss that and, and highlight the importance of it. Okay, thank you. Uh, who wants to go next? Yes, hello. Uh, I think, um, I mean, we, we all, we all, uh, suffer or, or experience the, the same uh, challenges, especially when it comes to the, uh, uh, the rest hours on, on board the vessel. And uh, I am very pleased to also hear that other companies are encouraging uh, the crew on board to, to raise their hands and raise their flag if, uh, if they see that uh, they are not able to, uh, to fulfill the rest hour uh, uh, schemes and which has also for the past couple of years luckily the the different port states control they have put uh, this kind of uh, figures highly up on their uh, agenda and uh, so so this is uh, it's easier for the for the serious companies to follow up on these items when it's uh, when it's also being focused from the low from the different governments and uh, and authorities so and we we also see that now during during the the covid and especially for us who is um, uh, traveling or, or sailing on australian ports the australian authorities have been very strict on uh, the crew change schemes and uh, to uh, to um, uh, to keep uh, a firm record on how long have each crew member been on board, and uh, what is your uh, plan schedule to replace these crew members if they have been over more than ten months on board. So it is, uh, and that is to to get that kind of change now, especially when all the flights are being cancelled suddenly, all of a sudden. It, uh, but it brings a more uh, commercial attention towards this kind of uh, topic that has just happened in the background without anybody noticing it. But now it is being on, on the top list of everybody's attention. And uh, if, if a vessel have to divert to another port because of crew change or uh, we have to delay because of rest hours, that is being much more commercially accepted now. Um, that is, uh, to, to, without going too much into de details, it is easier now than it was five, six years ago. Okay, thank you. Stan or Anders, do you have a perspective on this? Uh, yeah, I can. I can elaborate a little bit on this, and and uh, I, I totally agree that the commercial pressure is there, of course, and uh, all all captains and all the crew on board wants to do their best. Everybody wants to have a, a fully laden ship and go with full speed all the time. But uh, reality is, it's always a compromise from many many different aspects. I can give a very concrete example. One of our uh, liner ships with, between Helsinki and, and Tallinn can take maximum capacity of somewhere around 100, 105 trucks and semi trucks if uh, at the full cargo, so to say. But uh, the normal, let's say, during normal schedule, uh, it, it the time difference between loading 95 units as opposed to going up to full 100, 105, can be anywhere between 15 and uh, 30 minutes per, per call, port call. And uh, with a timetable of six departures every day, this goes without saying that uh, if we stretch the, the, the time in port 
with with this type of, of operations it we will exceed the the rest hours and and so on and of course all the margins for for practical errors and and so on on cardex also increases with with this kind of pressure so we really give a the Mars masters have very good experience and they they know how to find a good compromise between loading the right number of units and and keep keep uh, keep in line with the time table and rest hours and all the safety aspects there are okay thank you stan uh, anders do you want to add something uh, yeah there <laughs> I can just comment on the on the last year here when, when the corona the of course we have a huge problem with the crew change and that that's that have effect the safety on the deck I would say because uh, uh, the most problem that we have had is that uh, the regulation in each uh, country have changed all the time so so it's very uncertain when when the crew is coming home and of course this will affect the safety on deck. Uh, we have had uh, some crews that have been uh, over a year in, in some cases, but I mean, our HR have been <laughs> struggling a lot and have done a huge job to, to, to cut this down. And I would say that they have managed it and to come into to, oh, to each. So I will just, and otherwise, I can just, you know, follow the other talkers what they are saying. Okay, and uh, then uh, getting a bit bit more concrete here. Uh, uh, I men mentioned the, the how how do you instruct the newcomers, and and on the other hand, uh, one could argue that who's been very long in the business. I, I know my job and, and, and that could potentially lead, lead to certain, certain other risks and, and danger that, that one might not be that careful when and, and might be caught by surprise and, 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 and with catastrophic end result. Uh, but be very good to hear your perspective. How, how do you instruct uh, the, the newcomers and, and how do you uh, manage the the the, uh, the so-called uh, experienced crew to to stay vigilant. I mean, it's kind of a in, in this kind of operation, it's lots of routines, and and you have short turnaround times. And and uh, Mikael, you you mentioned the discussions, but how 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 in, in concrete? Uh, how how do you instruct and and how how you keep these instructions live? And and uh, that would be very interesting to hear. Yeah, we, we try our utmost when we have new people joining the vessels as uh, ratings or officers on the vehicle decks to buddy them up together and have them go separately side by side with uh, not necessarily a super experienced person, but at least with someone who is normal on the vessel to that operation. That is That is really what we aim to do and most often succeed with. And... Of course, there are uh, introduction documents, familiarization documents, etc., and those are gone through. But the, the the most important thing is really the hands-on instructions shown by the ordinary or by the experienced, so you call it, crew on the decks. So they really try to teach the new people on board uh, the risks associated in general. And if there are like ship specific risks associated with that vessel in terms of how specific she might be on certain aspects. But that is, that is really what we aim at. Okay, I see Philip, uh, you, ha you have your hand up. Yeah, I just want to uh, circle back on the, on the COVID-19 and um, that has actually increased our uh, uh, need for hands-on training because previously we have tried to have the same people uh, ro rotating by the same type of vessels. So they are familiar with that vessel type risk. But now in COVID-19, we have to have basically take guys from the pool who might never have been on that vessel type or that route or anything. So the need for uh, onboard training and onboard supervision has increased quite a lot 
during these two, last two years. And uh, as you said, a body system and, and also make sure that uh, junior staff are uh, shadowed by a, a more experienced staff for a lengthy period of time until they will be given the tasks uh, themselves. We have also focused a lot uh, the last years on uh, having enough people for each task so that one is supervising, maybe two are doing it, and the third one is just standing by for learning purposes. So uh, I think that's really, really important. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So who wants to go next, uh, Stan or Anders? Well, I can comment a little bit from, from our perspective too. I think that, that Mikael and, and we share quite a lot of the same uh, uh, problems and, and challenges with, with uh, regular services. And uh, I mentioned earlier that the regulatory side has put more, more demands on, on, on the training and the introduction of, of uh, the, the personnel and the crew on board. And uh, the STCV, STCW convention has quite high requirements on, on training for, for uh, personnel on board. And we, we have been working quite a lot with the familiarization of, of uh, new crew on board the, the last few years. And that is, of course, in all safety aspects on board. But uh, we have really, in our traffic, we have identified actually two, two things which are really critical and, and really dangerous on board during cargo cargo operations, loading and discharging. And that's one of those two things are handling of trailers. Because there you, you have uh, the ship's crew, which are uh, handling trailer, uh, what do you call it, Tra the, the trailer supports, and also uh, securing and, and uh, unlashing of trailers in combination with, with shore side stevedore. And uh, that, that is a, a big challenge. So you really need to have experienced and well-trained crew uh, to, to handle those type of cargo operations. The other, the other thing which we also have identified as, as very dangerous and, and critical is when we are loading trucks and, and uh, semi-trucks, especially reversing trucks into their parking spot. That is uh, also a very dangerous situation, and especially if you have, if you're working in two or three lanes at the same time and reversing trucks, that, that you need really to have very good routines and safe procedures and experienced crew working in those type of, of situations. Could I uh, then ask you, uh, could you, could you name these routines? That what 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 are the concrete routines? How how do you what what do you do? Well, uh, with the uh, cargo operations with, with trailers, you really need to have good routines and uh, clear signs between the, the crew and the truck driver, the Muffy, the Muffy uh, truck driver, when, it's, uh, when they actually can start to, to move the trailer and when it's stopped, uh, because it's, it's very dangerous, of course, to, to have a crew member in under the trailer if they the, the driver doesn't know if it's clear to, to start moving or, or not. And uh, that, that is one really, really important and, and then dangerous operation which, which needs to be clarified with, with the stevedoring company and, and the crew. That's, that's one example. Okay, thank you. So someone who wants to add on, on this topic or shall we move on? I can just add that we have also been focused more and more on the, inter in the, on the internal audits on the cargo operation on board from our side. Just to see the procedure, is it following or is it not followed or the instructions or oh, things like that. I think that is quite important also. So we did just, so we, uh, not just send out <laughs> familiarization forms and everything. We, we, we have to check it so it be f uh, fulfilled on board also. I can just finally mention that it's, it's already been mentioned, but the recent 
accidents we have had in Stena Line uh, ever since the fatal one in 2014 are related to blind spots. It's really important, as you say, Sten, also to be really clear on communications and to be really vigilant, both when driving Togmasters and trade cars, etc., to really be aware of your surroundings. And as a non-protected seafarer, then being on deck, nevertheless, wearing high vis, whatever, you need to be seen. You need to be seen by the ones operating the machinery. Otherwise, you're in great danger. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, this might be a bit painful question, actually, but um, I, I do it anyways. And uh, you, Mikael, you, you already mentioned that you, you had a fatal accident and... Uh, all of you have said that it's, it's a high risk environment and and i suppose you you in the panel you know the, the, the actual reality and uh, for for our listeners who, who follow this webinar if you could give a perspective that how many accidents i mean you don't need to go into details but just to get 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 the picture that how many incidents and accidents we are we are looking at in in, in practical terms like uh, once a month once a week or or once a year. I can tell you from Stena Line ever since the wake, the ultimate wake up call in 2014 on, on May 31st when we lost a young AB on the vehicle deck of Stena Saga who had another fatal accident and one serious injury. So we're talking about three since 2014. Thank you. Philip? Now, we have been uh, pretty lucky with not having uh, touch wood uh, an incident with the crew for many, many years. But we see there's an increasing uh, frequency of stevedoring accidents because they are not skilled to operate the machinery. So they either reverse when they're not supposed to reverse or they are not skilled in driving such a heavy machinery down a rope to the lower decks or something. And uh, so... That's an issue. But one thing that I thought of um, uh, before we start this webinar is that I see a potential danger in electrification of vehicles because you can't hear them. They don't make any sound. And also we have seen on the electrical vehicles, especially personal vehicles, is that uh, it's much tougher for them to keep the speed limit within the, vehicle, within the uh, car decks because the torque is immediate. It's not like you have shift gear and things. It just goes, and uh, so th that's a potential danger I see going forward. Okay, thank, thank you, Philip. You. Um, who, who wants to go next? Uh, Anders, Einar, then. Yeah, we have had uh, we, uh, as Philip said, because <laughs> we are under <laughs> Valens Willensen, but uh, we have had some uh, near misses, I will say maybe once a year or something it's not not so much okay thank you yeah i can say from our side it, it's very much dependent on on the number of port calls per per day per week per per year and so on uh, the, the frequency of reported accidents or or incidents or near misses but it's uh, it, it happens every now and then, I can say, and, and for, for the ships who are, are in regular traffic on a very tight schedule, there are more, more reports, naturally. And uh, Einar, do you have a perspective on this? Yeah, I can, uh, I can agree to what the other participants have, uh, have said here, and of course, uh, we see that um, our incidents uh, since we had uh, it, it doesn't happen uh, serious incident does not knock on wood uh, happened too too often of course for we are a deep sea uh, deep sea operator and we have less port calls per day on average than the short sea calls and and our main focus is uh, is that uh, we must bring the, the cargo that we load on board our vessel if that is in a safe condition it will also uh, enhance the safety 
during both cargo operation and also the the sea voyage. Uh, so, so that is uh, that is where we see for the couple of years that we we had incidents related to the uh, how the cargo was prepared for sea passage or not. Hey, thank you. Uh, the blind spot was was mentioned, and and uh, again, uh, I, I'm, I do I do not actually apologize, but uh, I, I need to ask this. And uh, the other other blind spot I, I could think of is that uh, the reports coming in, and, and and all of you in 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 the panel, you sit in uh, in in a safety management position uh, in, in more or less direct way. Uh, do you get all the important reports and, and, and is it easy to report to you? Uh, I mean, is it a paper form or is it an app or how, how do you do the reporting and, and how quickly you can have the change uh, uh, on the row row deck when, when, when you get this uh, incident or near miss and uh, non-conformity reports? We have changed the, uh, uh, we have changed the routine. So, so we also, the crew can also uh, do a report near 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 incident in on the intranet today because uh, what we can see we are not getting in uh, all the reports that that happens near misses much more than than we we have report from i will say okay stay nice to see you have your hand up no, I, I think this uh, is a bit of a, a gray zone. Of course, it's it's a little bit of work to, to make a report in our uh, non-conformance system. Uh, everybody on board can do it and do make make a report naturally, but uh, I I suspect some some things just pass on board without our knowledge. But uh, in this in this general context, I think. Uh, to, to ensure a safe culture and safe routines and procedures on board. The, the more important thing is that this is a part of the regular ongoing occupational safety work on board. And uh, our ships are, are working and we from the office side try to encourage the ships to work with risk assessments and safe procedures more or less on a continuous basis. So I think that that is one really important aspect to, to consider to, to have a safe working environment on board on board the ships and the cardex. Okay, thank you, Stan. I see Philip, you have your hand up. Yeah, if if the near misses or near accident or whatever we would like to call them occurs whilst the vessel is in port, we have a very low threshold for the crew to report directly to our uh, cargo superintendent or to the Stevedo foreman, and we, who will then do a dig digital report at the time of the place. So um, I'm I'm more concerned about what happens in the open ocean that is not reported. So say it like that. Okay, I see. Einar, you have your hand up. Yes, and we have, uh, I mean, uh, with the making a report is, uh, can be time consuming. And also the tool for filing the report on, uh, is usually stashed away in, a, in an office in the accommodation. So what we have, uh, we have now implemented is that um, we we have upgraded the IT systems on board our vessels, allowing the the crew to make instant reports via iPads uh, that they uh, carry that that is accessible in the tally office uh, during cargo operations. So if there are an incident related to either uh, cargo or or personal injuries or anything like that. Um, they can pull out the uh, the iPad and take uh, direct photos and fill in the correct form so that the correct parties are being notified uh, of the uh, of the incident. So they they don't have to take photos with a camera, run up to the office, download the pictures, etc., and then valuable time have um, have been uh, missed. 
so so they can do the reporting uh, on deck as it happens without uh, without removing their eyes of the uh, of the incident and and the site okay thank you einar uh, mikael do you have a on anders uh... yeah i would say the final um... The thing we have implemented and really pushed later years is to stop the job procedure that whenever something has almost happened or indeed has happened, we take five, we stop and the Stevie Doring people and the crew present on that vehicle deck, they take a quick debrief and see what went wrong, uh, what to do to prevent it from immediately happening again. And then, of course, it is the reporting uh, and we do get a lot of reports of uh, potential near misses, which needs to be handled. And we know it's 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 a harm uh, or it's a risky environment, the vehicle decks. So it's it's a matter of really analyzing the trends and tendencies and see what what's what's the thing, what's the major things going on when it comes to near miss reporting and and incidents, accidents actually happening in relation to vehicle decks. What what's really happening, and how to do our utmost to prevent that from really happening uh, from a near miss into an actual accident. That's that's taking a lot of our time, really trying to understand that and put actions in place, trying to prevent future future recurrence. Okay, thank you. And Philip, I see your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, now, I would really like to see that we get some kind of industry forum for us uh, handling rural cargo and vehicle, uh, et cetera, because we can't learn from each other because we're not willing to share with each other and we shouldn't compete on safety. We should compete on quality and efficiency, but not on safety because it's it's the seafarer's life out there, regardless of whom they work for. Thank you, Philip. And uh, I will take that challenge on me and uh, we shall arrange and then I will come back to all of you and, and, and the whole uh, row, row community, Robux community, when this will take place. And uh, I will assure you it will not take a long time. And uh, unfortunately, the clock is having more turnaround time than what we wish. And, and I suppose uh, it's time for Q&A, uh, if we have any, any Q &A, uh, questions from, from the audience. We have actually one question from the audience. Uh, I'm going to read it to you and I think it's to anyone in the panel. So please respond, any one of you. Uh, how do you take account the AFS alternative fuel system cars like electric cars on board your vessels? Do you load them separately from others or how has your company taken account the firefighting equipment and training the crew with these cars? Go ahead, Philip. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we as an owner operator have had a huge focus on what we call for alternative fuel vehicles. It could be electrical, it could be hydrogen, it could be LPG, it could be a hybrid. And uh, we have run a lot of studies uh, together with universities, etc., and uh, firefighting uh, companies, etc. And uh, there's no indication that a alternative fuel vehicle have caused more fires than traditional internal combustion engines. But we have seen during tests that um, the more SOC, state of charge, you have on an electrical vehicle, the easier it is to become a thermal runaway, which is more, more or less impossible to stop. So we have a demand on our side that we don't allow an electrical vehicle with a state of charge above 50%. We are trying to get it down to 30%, which is the airline limit for lithium batteries. Uh, the biggest source of fire on board Roro vessels, at least deep sea, is secondhand units. So we have uh, internal regulations that we need, we can't, load uh, second-hand vehicles at the same deck as alternative fuel vehicles. Uh, hydrogen vehicles, uh, we park in a certain way because the, the tank has a pressure release valve. So if there is a fire, it will release the hydrogen and then, but we put them against the bulkhead so you don't get the flame that is 200 meters long if something should happen. 
So what we have worked on immensely is the same as ANR on cargo quality acceptance, checking vehicles, especially secondhand vehicles. And from certain parts of the world, we actually disconnect the normal batteries on secondhand vehicles uh, uh, during uh, onboard uh, transport. And uh, we have also worked a lot with fire detection systems because the only thing that can prevent the fire from spreading is early detections. We are working a lot on early detection, both when it comes to heat and smoke and other uh, partitions that you can actually detect a fire or a potential fire at the very early stage. And then in the cargo load plans, which are handed to the vessels uh, before departure, so they can make stability calculations properly, et cetera, has clearly marked which vehicles that are alternative fuel, because it's very hard to know because some of them don't have any sign saying it's the LPG or it's the hydrogen. So um, that's why we mark it uh, in different colors on the load plans. So I hope that gave you some ideas on how we are tackling uh, these issues. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Philip. And, and uh, I see, Einar, you have your hand up and we are uh, almost running out of time. And uh, if we, uh, we do want to hear your comment and if you can steer it a bit more on, on the Day, today's agenda on, on how, how it relates to railroad safety. I, I would be really glad. Uh, go ahead, Aina. Yes, no, just uh, to uh, uh, just as a quick comment to what uh, Philip said. Uh, we are also uh, focusing on the commercial differences between the different fuels fuel types on board uh, that that the different commodities have, uh, not only on the car segment but also on the high and heavy. And that is uh, that takes uh, takes some time to actually get uh, to get it commercially different commodities. So then it is easier to uh, to identify on board. And but um, very much of what Philip said, we also are uh, working on on highlighting the uh, the units on board, and we disconnect all the batteries uh, to make it safer for also for the crew to avoid. Uh, self-igniting of the used second-hand vehicles. Okay, thank you, Einar. And uh, I'm uh, uh, coming to a conclusion that uh, we are running out of time. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy that you, you brought up the, the reporting, the, the iPads. And, and we have also created a solution of our own. And, and we would like to present that. And, and after the presentation, uh, we have the final comments and then we, we end the webinar. But uh, I think, Johanna, you have the, the presentation ready. Shipping is a challenging industry and the sea can be tough. Fortunately, we sailors stick together. I have tested this app that I have taken and I'm going to comment a little bit. I think that app is very good and I think that we will have to use it for our business. Accidents, injuries and near misses happen. Knowledge of them needs to be mobilized so that we can learn from these situations. First impression of the app is very positive. The app has many useful functions and I believe that the most useful for us would be the safety observation module. Download Alandia's new loss prevention application. It provides real-time reporting of accidents and near-miss situations. The information gathered will help prevent damage in advance. The app is really easy to use and it helps your crew to stay up to date in safety matters by using gamification, storytelling and other mind supporting strategies. The app enhances uh, two-way communications in situations where insurance will be involved and the app uh, enables easier and more accessibility to contact Alandia. Manage your company's risks with loss prevention app. Please contact with Alandia to get access to your loss prevention app. And uh, with that uh, sort of a sales pitch, uh, I really would like to thank you for your time and, and your valuable insights. And uh, uh, at, at least it looks that we need to run to part two in not distant future. And uh, thank you, Philip. I will take the challenge of the, uh, the, the Roro safety uh, conference at, at some form. And I'll, I'll come back to all of you and, and the worldwide Roro Robax community. Thank you so much for your time and uh, looking forward to uh, next webinar. Thank you. Thank you everybody for attending today's webinar and thank you to our knowledgeable panel and moderator. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.